Joining us now is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and professor at the University of Alabama Law School, and Eugene Robinson, columnist at The Washington Post. A big welcome to the both of you. So, so, Joyce, Steve Bannon left the Trump White House in August 2017, if memory serves, after a power struggle with Jared Kushner. And there is this other question about whether a former president can exert executive privilege. Is that not the prerogative of the sitting president? Bannon has always been the weakest case to use executive pri privilege uh, against these subpoenas. And by weakest case, I mean he doesn't have a case at all, Jeff. As you've pointed out, executive privilege is meant largely to cover things like deliberations between White House officials to ensure that the president can get good, open advice from the folks around him. Bannon loses on, on all counts here, not an, a member of the executive branch. And even if he was... Trump is now a former president, and the person who can assert executive privilege is Joe Biden. Otherwise, imagine what it would look like. You would have every living president with the ability to exert executive privilege in any situation, and that would be unworkable. But of course, the strategy here is classic Trump. Throw everything into the courts, hope for delay, slow down procedures uh, in front of the House committee uh, on January 6th. And, and so it's same old strategy from Trump land. And Eugene, on that point, I mean, I, I'm struck uh, mm -hmm. by the degree to which the committee learned the lessons of impeachment uh, for the very things that Joyce just said. And they mm -hmm. went directly to the subpoenas. They did not uh, mess around with right. the request process, thinking that these folks would comply voluntarily. Right. And now I think the, I think that this committee needs to go directly to the consequences. I mean, they, they need to, to move to enforce these subpoenas. Um, uh, I would I would think um, uh, I don't know if they'll go so far as to um, to declare uh, these uh, four individuals in inherent contempt, uh, um, which theoretically could um, uh, involve the sergeant at arms of the House um, going out to arrest them. Um, but I do um, hope and suspect they they may uh, uh, Consult with the Justice Department uh, and and seek to um, uh, to seek to have have justice help them uh, enforce these subpoenas. These are official subpoenas um, of of the U.S. Congress, and they should mean something. Yeah. And, and Joyce, I also want to ask you about the Senate Judiciary Committee, which has released this new report on the former president's efforts to pressure the DOJ to overturn the election that he lost. And there was this, uh, he had this threat to replace the acting attorney general with one of his loyalists. And then that led to a threat of mass resignations from several top DOJ officials, U.S. attorneys, even the White House counsel, and what they called a murder-suicide pact, if President Trump uh, went that route. As a former U.S. attorney yourself, I mean, how significant was that stance in preventing the potential weaponiz weaponization of the DOJ? I suppose it's good to know that these folks had some standards, that at the end of the day, if Trump was going to fire uh, his third attorney general, I guess actually his fourth attorney general, and replace him with someone who would do his bidding, that they were finally prepared to, to quit their jobs as a group. But this is really damning everything that went on at the Trump uh, Justice Department with faint praise, Jeff. The standards here were so low for what they were willing to do to protect the Justice Department and the country. I think that we can all be happy that they prevented this final mood move by the Trump administration. But where were they far earlier? Even if we're only thinking about the election itself, where were they when Trump tried to begin a, a, a entire cadre of meritless fraud investigations. Why couldn't they have spoken out during impeachment? So yes, at the end of the day, this was effective in keeping Trump from replacing Jeffrey Rosen at the tail end with someone who would have been much worse. But ultimately, these are people who are in a position from at least November on to prevent the events that ultimately set the January 6th incursion against the Capitol in motion. I think it's a little bit too much to call them heroes here. And Eugene, the Judiciary Committee, they've laid out a series of recommendations in the report. We can put those recommendations up on the screen. You, you see them there. Mm -hmm. Are these going to be significant or sufficient enough guardrails going forward, do you think? 
Um, and I, actually, no, um, because these they're guardrails. I mean, guardrails mm-hmm. depend upon the the goodwill and intentions of uh, of those uh, on either side, right? And so, when you have a normal um, president and a normal White House um, who respects those guardrails, um, uh, then then sure, they're effective. When you have Donald Trump. Uh, or someone like him. Uh, I don't think they are. Ultimately, the president is the head of the executive branch, and the Justice Department is part of the executive branch, and that's 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 a feature of our system. And it is it is difficult for me to to uh, to, to figure out what could be done to to legally separate uh, the president from justice uh, in a. Uh, you know, in a permanent way, I think we rely on the on the on the goodwill and intentions of our public officials. That's a good point. Eugene Robinson, Joyce Vance, thanks so much for your time.